I was 17 years old, athletic, took a dive, and bang, I, I can't use my hands, I can't move, my legs, everything's paralyzed. I'm a quadriplegic. The doctor announced that I had severed my spinal cord at the fourth cervical level, that I'd never use my hands or my legs for the rest of my life, and he walked out of the door. I can't live like this. And I just sank into depression. A Christian friend shared with me, Johnny, God permits what he hates to accomplish that which he loves. I realized God takes no pleasure in my spinal cord injury, but he loves the way he is changing me in it and encouraging others through it. Psalm 10 says that God hears the cry of the afflicted. His heart goes out to those with disabilities. He is filled with compassion for those with special needs. I'm Johnny Erickson Tata. I'm a Christian, author, speaker, advocate, painter, Oh my goodness, I can't believe I do all those things. But I do them because I want people to know the God that I love. I would not trade this intimacy with God, this sweetness, this nearness, this tenderness, this preciousness of, of faith come alive in my life. I wouldn't trade it for any amount of walking. There are one billion people with disabilities in the world, 80% of whom live in developing nations. That is, to me, overwhelming. I want to do everything I can to make a difference in their lives. I think God is using people with disabilities to wake up the church. God is up to something big. Este es mi libro, mi historia. Si, en este es el libro. Outwardly, our bodies are wasting away, but inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. It looks as though the foot pedals need to come up just a little bit. Certainly. Yo le bendiga, hermano. My husband, Ken, and I love doing Johnny and Friends together. Whether it's going to a family retreat and hanging out with other couples, whether it's delivering wheelchairs and Bibles. Is a Bible in the Spanish language? We want to get the word out. God has not abandoned those with disabilities, no. He is working through them. God's power always shows up best through weakness. The Bible says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Defend the rights of the weak and the needy. And we do that at Johnny and Friends. Through our Christian Institute on Disability, we are advocates. We are championing the disabled, whether it's right to life, end of life issues, physician assisted suicide, euthanasia. We speak God's truth. Johnny and Friends stands for the spark that started the movement to take the gospel where the world is bleeding out of control. I want to be there. I've got a message to share. I would rather be in this wheelchair knowing him than on my feet without him. And that is worth living for. And I know part of that welcome goes for my wonderful husband of 33 years this year, yeah, Ken Tata. I had the biggest blessing backstage. Um, Christopher put his hand on my shoulder. Jesus, help Johnny bless people tonight. I love it, I love it. What an awesome evening it has been thus far. Oh my goodness, the worship, the testimonies, just seeing those flags. So welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you are here. And I'm convinced that over the next three days, heaven is going to shake and shower down on us a true visitation from Jesus and his Holy Spirit. Because I know nothing, absolutely nothing, delights the Savior more than to show himself up as grand and glorious through weakness and disability, amen? Amen. I can feel this electric sense of anticipation in the room. This place is a buzz. We are an amazing, God 
gather global fellowship of like-hearted, like-minded friends who love making Jesus real to those who need him most. So this is historic. This is momentous. This is a milestone. And this is a chance for all of us to get edified and encouraged and blessed and equipped. This is a chance for us all to hear from each other, to learn each other's stories, to understand each other's ministry, to listen to each other's hearts. And friends, tonight, I get a chance to share my heart with you. Because people with disabilities in this dark, dark world, and isn't it a dark world right now, they need Jesus like never before. Proof of that is in a disturbing article that I read last week on ABC News Online. The report was about Samuel Forrest, who lives in Armenia. He was very excited about his newborn baby, but hospital authorities would not allow him to see his newborn or his wife. The doctor told him, quote, this is from the article, there is a real problem with your son, and we want you to know you do not have to keep him. That's when Samuel discovered that his son had Down syndrome. Let me read from the article. Samuel said, quote, when they finally let me see my baby, I looked at this little guy and I said, he's beautiful, he's perfect, and I am absolutely keeping him. Holding his newborn in his arms, he walked into his wife's hospital room, but her reaction is not what he expected. I got the ultimatum right then, Samuel told ABC News. She told me that if I kept our baby, we would get a divorce. And then he adds, and listen to this, he adds wondering, what happens when a baby like this is born here and they tell you that you do not have to keep him? I mean, what happens to them? What do they do with these children? Despite his wife's warnings, Samuel said that he would hold on to his son, and three days later, she filed for a divorce. When I read this article, I sat in front of the computer for a long time, staring at Samuel's questions. What happens to these children with disabilities? What do they do to them? Well, I know what happens to them. You know what happens to them. Infants with disabilities in places like this hospital in Armenia are either starved to death or they are warehoused in a dismal, dank orphanage where if, if, if they survive, they are tied to their cribs until they are five-year-olds or 11, 12, and even 15-year-olds. What happens to these children? What do they do to these children? When I served on the U.S. State Department's Disability Advisory Committee, the report on the rights of disabled children came out during my tenure, and it stated that, quote, disabled children suffer far more violence and abuse than other children. They are imprisoned in institutions, cupboards, sheds, and all too often starved to death. In East Africa, albino children are abducted by gangs, and then they are used in ritualistic sacrifices. We have at this conference, in fact, one woman whose ministry it is to rescue these children. And just last week, perhaps you read it, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child reported that terrorists, ISIS in the Middle East and in Africa, are actively seeking out young adults with intellectual disabilities as suicide bombers. Yes, it is barbaric what is happening in so many parts of the world, but do not think that the West is immune, oh no. In the Netherlands, 
neonatal physicians have the legal right to determine which sick and disabled children should either live or be euthanized. Over 8% of all babies who die each year in the Netherlands are killed by their own doctors after they are born, and their only crime is their disability. In the United Kingdom, the elderly and disabled are put up for auction by local councils on eBay websites with care facilities then bidding to offer them a bed. The cheapest offer usually wins, and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that the decision on where an elderly person or a person with a disability may spend his final years is made by a computer program that is only interested in costs. Years ago, when I was serving on the National Council on Disability, our council critiqued a report issued by the National Institutes on Health. It was on disability prevention. One of the suggestions proposed that abortion should be a disability prevention strategy. All 15 of us on the National Council on Disability were repulsed by such an idea. And you need to understand, we were all from diff different political parties. We were from the left and the right. We were liberals, we were conservatives. And so we shot back a scathing reply to the National Institutes of Health, telling them, no, abortion should not be a disability prevention strategy. But now, just two decades later, a short 20 years, the termination of unborn children with disabilities is not only accepted as a disability prevention strategy, it is promoted, actively promoted. Oh friend, it is a sad, sad day when in any country, people's fears about disability or their prejudice or their bias becomes the basis for national social policy. Now, I realize these are not pleasant things to hear. They are painful, but I do not, you do not dare brush aside the harsh realities of disability. If Jesus loves the little children, and we know well that he does, then we better believe that he really loves children with disabilities. Children like those little girls with albinism in East Africa. And for the sake of Jesus Christ, I have such a passion to reach people with disabilities, and I know that you do too. And there's not a day when I wheel into the International Disability Center that I don't think about them, pray for them, and work so hard on their behalf. It's why I keep this photo in my office wall. Some of you took tours of the International Disability Center today, and perhaps when you entered my office, you saw this photo on the wall. When we were delivering wheelchairs in Ghana, we encountered this man. He had broken his back and lived in intractable pain. And here he sits in his only comfortable position, leaning, up, leaning against the column of his house with only three walls and half of a roof. <clears throat> when Doug Mazza, the president of Johnny and Friends, was on that Wheels for the World team, he asked this gentleman if he might take his photograph. At that point, the man looked at his T-shirt. It had fallen off his shoulder. And with his British accent, he said, wait one moment. And then he painstakingly lifted his filthy T-shirt up on his shoulder, smoothed it out, pressed it nice and flat. Now I am ready. You know what that tells me? That man, all he wants is to be treated with respect and human dignity. It tells me that every person, every person ought to be treated with respect and human dignity. Meanwhile, people with mental illnesses are being caged in psychiatric institutions. 
I remember when I served on the Disability Advisory Committee in the U.S. State Department, the USAID branch of the State Department was entertaining financial requests from certain countries. One request had come for um, the painting of the walls of a psychiatric institution. This country required funds to completely paint this big institution. Well, it was our job on the Disability Advisory Committee to make certain that before we issued a USAID grant, that people with disabilities were being treated with human dignity and respect in that institution. We did a little investigation. The people with mental illnesses and psychiatric illnesses in that institution were chained to the walls and they were living in cages. Needless to say, we did not approve that USAID grant to paint the exterior of the institution. Young girls with Down syndrome are actively sought out now for human trafficking. Mothers of disabled children are being beaten, and young men with cerebral palsy who live in care facilities that are unlicensed here in the United States are often sexually abused. Worn and weary mothers are tirelessly fighting on behalf of their children with developmental disabilities, and then there are the fathers, fathers like Samuel Forrest and his beautiful little guy with Down syndrome. Yes, these are painful, harsh realities. And I'm sorry that we must begin this conference this way, but you know what? We have to hear the bad news, because only then do we really appreciate how great and awesome the good news really is. May I hear an amen? amen. Absolutely. Besides, the Lord, the Lord in Exodus chapter three has seen the misery of his people. The Lord has seen, he has heard them crying out and he can bear their suffering no longer. He has come down to rescue them. He says in Job chapter 36, I will deliver the weak in their suffering, and I will speak to them in their affliction. He will take pity on the weak and needy, it says in Psalm 72. And again, in Psalm 12, he says, because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will now arise. The Lord will arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those that malign them. Oh, friend. God knows, God understands, God sees, God hears, his heart is moved. And he is arising because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of every family with special needs from Albania to Atlanta, from Cameroon to California, from Thailand to Toronto, from Jordan to Jackson, Mississippi, from Serbia to Seattle, from Liberia to Los Angeles. God is doing everything, everything from his end, everything to alleviate the affliction of people with disabilities here in the West and in other parts of the world. He is bending over backward to rescue disabled children that are being abandoned in dumpsters. He is heaven bent on restoring broken marriages. He is fighting. His Holy Spirit is fighting on behalf of every adult and every child who has autism or Alzheimer's, spina bifida or spinal cord injury. And he has called you to fight beside him. And friend, I can think of no higher and more holy calling. Oh, what a calling he has given you and me that we should be privileged to serve alongside and minister among the weak and the needy, to share the gospel where the bad news is really, really bad. And your presence here at this Global Access Conference proves that you are actively engaged in the global struggle to, quote, loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke, just as it says in Isaiah chapter 58. You do this 
This is what you do. This is what you are best at. In Peru, Corazonas Unidas has been serving special needs families and distributing wheelchairs in some of the most remote and God-forsaken, it seems, parts of Peru. In El Salvador, where many disabilities are caused by gang violence, Iglesia de Zion in San Salvador is giving the love of Christ. They are healing broken hearts. When I visited Romania in 1982, in conjunction with the American Embassy, we did our best, the American Embassy did its best to get us into rehab centers or hospitals. Where are the disabled, we asked. And we were told, Romania has no disabled. I could not believe it then, and I certainly don't believe it now. But now, so many years later, there is a federation of church leaders in Romania serving the disabled. There are international family retreats in Romania. There are wheelchair distributions. There are interns going to Romania. Beyond suffering is taught in seminaries in Romania. And in Serbia, students at a Bible college there are providing hands-on ministry at day camps and family retreats in China. Bethesda Rehab Ministry in Anshan is reaching for Christ some of the poorest disabled people in the world. I know because I read the newsletters. Oh my goodness. In Thailand, disability ministry is now spilling over into the borders of Burma. And in the Philippines, our friend Moses goes door to door inviting families who have hidden away their disabled. And Uganda, our Beyond Suffering curriculum, is being taught at African Renewal University. And in Ghana, so many more wheelchairs are being distributed in rural, distant areas far away from major cities like, like Accra and Kumasi. So let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Don't you love that verse? It's from Amos chapter 5, verse 24, and it is right there at the base of our chapel. The first thing that you see when you walk up the ramp of the International Disability Center. When we built the center, that was the verse that I wanted front and center. I wanted people to understand that disability is a justice issue. May I hear an amen? amen. Absolutely, every child with a disability whether unborn or newborn, has the right to life. I was so excited when I read in the news four days ago that state assemblymen in Ohio have introduced a bill which would ban pregnancies based solely on the diagnosis of disability. I think we should applaud that. That is amazing. So the unborn and newborn infants have the right to life in places like the Netherlands. Every adult with a disability and his family member has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. And every disabled person should enjoy access, global access, into the mainstream of life. And you, you friend, are uniquely called. You are uniquely gifted. You have been sanctified by the Lord Jesus. You have been set apart to advocate for that access. You have been called to advocate for true moral rights. And when I call them moral rights, they are indeed moral, which means they find their morality in the Word of God. But if you take God out of the picture, rights become nothing more than people's willful, stubborn determinations, and then the exercise of rights becomes nothing more than a national competition between who's more victimized than who, and we become a haranguing group of individuals who do not care about the common good. But true rights, moral rights, have their basis in the Word of God. When you exercise your efforts on behalf of the rights of the weak and the needy, you are on God's side. 
God is on your side. And Proverbs 31 is your clarion call, where it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Speak up for the rights of those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And please know, please know that when you do this, you are not merely declaring the gospel or demonstrating the gospel. No, you become the gospel. You become the gospel to families with special needs. And what does it mean to, quote, become the gospel? Well, while God's love for us is unconditional, our experience of his love is not unconditional. We must keep giving the love of Jesus away in order to experience it. Let me say that again. We must keep giving the love of Jesus away, constantly divesting ourselves, constantly dying to our own preferences. We must keep giving it away to others in order to experience Christ's love. Jesus said this himself in John chapter 13, verse 34, when he said, quote, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And that's what you do. You embody the good news. Disability ministry requires you to become immersed in people's needs, just as Christ has done for you. Perhaps other ministries and churches may be content to have you serve at a tidy, safe, arm's length distance, untouched, unscathed, unsullied, but no, disability ministry gets you down into the dirt of all that it means to be human. Perhaps others do a tidy, neat program, but you don't do a program, you do a person. May I hear an amen? You do a person, absolutely. Jackie Mills Fernald of McLean Bible Church knows this well. Jackie knows what it means to, quote, become the gospel to eight-year-old Arthur. When he first came to access ministry at McLean Bible Church, he was shrieking, he was flailing, he was thumping on the floor, biting everybody for almost two years. Often, they had to roll on the floor with Arthur as he kicked and screamed. Can you imagine being another Sunday school teacher and walking by the special needs classroom at that point? You would go, oh my goodness, let me get out of here. But you know what? When Jackie Fernald was rolling around on the floor with Arthur, holding onto his arms as he kicked and screamed, she was becoming the gospel to him and to his mother and father. That is becoming the gospel. That is embodying the gospel to someone. Absolutely, yes, applaud that. Thank you, Jesus. And the Arthur that you would meet today, and perhaps Pastor Lon Solomon may speak about Arthur in his message later on in the conference. The Arthur you would meet today is a self-aware, generous young man who loves chatting with people and loves sharing the gospel with his classmates and his teachers. His prayers include intercessions for missionaries and for the young girl in Guatemala that he, get that, Arthur, sponsors a kid in Guatemala through World Vision. Friend, that's a story of redemption. And Arthur's transformation is yet another case that Jackie uses to encourage other parents. After all, she says, aren't we all a work in progress? Aren't we all a work in progress? Oh, friends, this is, this is exactly why the church needs Arthur and families like his. Children like Arthur remind the church that we are all a work in progress. We are all broken and in need of redemption. 
disability ministry reminds the church of something it has forgotten, that we are all frail, we are all enfeebled, we are all weak and needy, and in desperate requirement of God's transforming grace. Disability ministry forbids the gospel to be conveyed from a position of power or influence. No, disability ministry requires that we enter Christ's kingdom from the point of grace because we are all needy in God's eyes. The church has forgotten this, but I believe that he is raising up and fueling the global disability ministry movement so that the church might be called back to its foundations to give the gospel from a point of weakness and need because we are all a work in progress. So to echo Samuel Forrest, what happens to them? What do they do with the disabled? Well, I tell you what, friends, let's ask the community that question. Let's ask the church that question. Let's pose it to the church because the church needs special needs families. Otherwise, the church will look just like another Emily Post Picture Perfect congregation, all neat and normal and tidy and rule-keeping and regulated. Oh my goodness, God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. May God keep the church from such a demise. And that's why Jesus has his hand of blessing on disability ministry. That's why he is encouraging you because disability ministry keeps the church messy, messy and cluttered and needy and dependent on God. Disability ministry requires the full immersion of a congregation, not, not just a, a, a special needs department all segregated and separated and set off to the side. No, rather, disability ministry, we're gonna campaign for this, needs to be integrated, right? Integrated. Bring the church back to its roots, not just to give the gospel, to, to, to embody it, not just to declare and demonstrate the good news, but to be the good news. Oh, friends, I know you get this. I know you understand this. I know you resonate with this. And it is why God has brought you here. It is why you have come. You long to connect with other like-hearted, like-minded believers who share this same kind of passion. You have made great sacrifices to be here. And I personally am so thankful to God for that. You are gonna get, get connected to others who share your heart, because being here and telling your story is that important. We need to hear your story. And I promise, over the next three days, you will not be disappointed. Over the next three days, you will be empowered and equipped as this, in this as we look at disability in relation to Christ, the church, and the community. So friend, I salute you. I am grateful to God for you. I thank you. You are making the kingdom of Christ strong in places where the bad news is very bad and the kingdom is weak. You are helping to stop the hemorrhaging in places where the world is bleeding out of control. And I am so honored, so blessed, so privileged, so delighted to labor alongside you on behalf of the world's one billion people with disabilities. I'm alone, yet not alone. God's the light that will guide me home. With his love,
yet not alone I will not be bent in fear he's the refuge I know is near in his strength I find my own by his faithfulness he shows that so mighty is his shield, for his love is now revealed. When my steps are lost and desperate for a guide, I can feel his touch, a soothing prayer. And as I was singing that song, I was thinking of the many people with disabilities that you serve. They may be alone in some instances. They may be stuck in those dark, dank back bedrooms, but they're not alone. God will not forsake them. God will not abandon them. God will not forget them. So thank you for bearing that good news in places where the bad news is bad.